Well, I think there are lots of opportunities. First, uh, taking it from where the other discussed uh, prof has mentioned, is first to start to see education and research really as an essential service. Essential in the sense that we should be seeing ourselves in line with the doctors, the food distributors, the food growers, people who are supplying the business. So if we begin to see research and education in that light, then it's possible for us to really think around what is happening now. So for example, I don't know, it's very uh, not maybe so challenging for universities and researchers to think about uh, creating learning management systems. When I was in the University of Malaya, uh, two, three years before, um, would I say starting from 2018, they started to run what is called the e learning and it was in anticipation of uh, maybe natural disaster or some kind of disaster that would disrupt activities and mean that things have to be delivered from afar. So it was a clever idea in the sense that we have always had open universities, we have always had um, people um, doing uh, long distance learning and research, but the typical universities hadn't really thought about what happens if for any reason we are not able to meet. So we were then uh, obliged to have uh, uh, our lectures online. Uh, there are so many uh, programs and applications out there. The university ICT system or, uh, department and division, they were propped up and then the Moodle came in place and then we were able to run a few weeks. And thanks to that, immediately this happened because I'm still in contact with my colleagues. I'm still supervising some students from the university. I could see that by the one week, the second week, everybody was back in place using the system to be able to communicate with students, to be able to deliver their lectures, to be able to continue to collaborate. I'm currently collaborating in my research, you know, a bit um, mixed mode, um, qualitative kind of uh, humanities, social sciences research, you know. Um, but we are in, in five different countries, you know. One person from University of Ibadan and uh, some people in Malaysia. And, um, and we have uh, been working together for quite a few years now and we continue to work together. So the materials, in terms of being able to access the materials, what the guidelines is all about is social distancing, you know? For the researchers have to understand that the people we are waiting on to assist us in terms of like maybe even the medical sciences, scientists, the doctors, the, uh, the laboratory workers, we're waiting for them to bring us vaccines and medications to help us. They are working. They are physically in contact with their labs. We are asked to be socially distant. We are not really asked to be locked up. So if procedures and protocols can be in place, even for researchers that need the physical place or the labs to work, they can maybe with small modifications or some modifications, significant modifications, be able to do things in such a way that they can still go in there, carry out some work and come out. So in terms of, I've outlined quite a few uh, areas that I see there's a lot of work going on that uh, researchers can pick up and uh, maybe investigate some issues in terms of what is, um, um, the implications of COVID really is almost in every aspect of our lives. So you think about like the food chain and the agriculture, you know, the study of how the pandemic has affected the food supply, you know, housing, you know, how many people have been impact impacted because they're homeless, because they you know, they cannot pay their rent. These are kinds of research that you have to be in contact with people, not always physically, you can find ways of interviewing people. You can find ways of administering your surveys. You can find ways of creating the uh, data, you know, uh, from collecting it from people. But when it comes then to, you know, the uh, literature 
you know, you may have to request maybe your university to um, get um, online resources, online databases from the um, uh, publishers. I know that, for example, uh, when even now I hardly need to go anywhere to be able to, you know, read most of the uh, literature that I want to read because a lot of these are, are, are you know, now online and a lot of uh, publishers and um, uh, some of these um, like companies like Scopus, EBSCO, uh, they have, because of the COVID, uh, Web's law created um, opportunities that people can access some of the materials free, you know, even Amazon at some point was able to allow people to access and download materials free of charge because they know that people are having challenges going back to their libraries. So this is an opportunity for universities to think about going online with a lot of the uh, researchers who con to continue their work. Uh, there are issues, there are issues with frontline workers. How have they been protected? To what extent has this all impacted them? You know, the people who we thought that, you know, uh, were really low paid workers, but they are the ones now um, maintaining the system, you know, bringing the food, ensuring that uh, people, when they come to yeah. hospitals, uh, are taken care of. Those kind of like people, uh, how, what, how does the system protect them? You know, that uh, we're so reliant on them in terms of what they can do for us, but the society, the, these societal issues have to be um, our opportunities for researchers to, you know, find out uh, what is actually going on. And when you go out to interview somebody or to give a survey, you're, you're required to maintain like two meters distance or something like that. You can stay comfortably to, they find, they don't find ways to communicate with their lecturers, but actually quite a significant number of maybe Nigerians are already on, you know, Facebook or Twitter and all those kinds of uh, social media. You know, is it possible? I know like some schools that have actually started to get in contact with their students by doing videos and sending it out to the parents and then the parents share with the children and then they get back. Can researchers look at what is working in these areas, what is not working, what needs to be developed? Because if a parent or guardian for a child has access to like three hours of uh, access to Facebook in a week, that's probably enough to keep the child motivated now. Is a researcher that has to find out how many kids can do this in Nigeria, how many parents are able to, and those who are not able to, what can be done? As opposed to saying we are going to wait until some, something eventually uh, kind of takes COVID-19 away. Because yes, COVID-19, can end, but how about in future, if such a thing again happens, or even if it's not a pandemic, a health pandemic, what about a natural disaster, whatever the situation is. So there are opportunities of, in almost every area I can think about in sciences, social sciences, and uh, humanities. You know, some researchers are looking at mental health populations, to what extent has this all challenged us mentally, information pulling and all that. Universities immediately here created rapid response project funding. You know, almost every university. So if like, for example, you're a researcher in the university, you might want to find out from the management, you know, is it possible, no matter how little, to create certain kind of funds to see if you can challenge your community to be able to develop something, uh, a thought, and carry out the research. So if the university were to announce maybe a grant for a COVID-related event, it will get the lecturers thinking, oh, I want to get this grant, or oh, I want to make the application. It will get them thinking, how do we, that means that they're still interested in us working, even from home, I'm going to apply for this research. So I think that's what the universities here did. You know, I can't see any university that didn't really deep into their pocket as a stimulus for the community, the research community, to announce a kind of project funding, you know, because it, it helps to keep alive 
the the work of researchers and keep them going and eventually is hopeful that you know um innovative um research and output will be able to come out from that then for those who are still thinking how do i go about it i cannot find anything happening in nigeria i cannot find anything happening among my colleagues how do i get the research grant research funding and all that almost all of these that i have looked into they are looking for international collaborators why because covid is a global issue so a problem identified for example in alaska and a solution found in Alaska can have some significance or relevance in Africa and vice versa. So I have seen quite a few, a lot, you know, if I could count, research calls from institutions, for example, the Social Sciences Research Council of Canada. The group of people there are trying to find out how do people trust the information out there about COVID? How much do people understand what COVID is all about? What are people's perception of this risk? And how, uh, you know, trying to engage the public. And they openly said in the website where they announced their project that they are looking for people from any part of the world to be able to bring on their own perspective to this research so that eventually when they publish it, it can cut across, you know, uh, different dimensions. Now, um, I've already mentioned, so there are quite a few of that, which if there is time, maybe eventually I can put in the chat section, the links to these um, resources that I've been able to uh, find and uh, can share with everybody. So universities have to increase, or the research communities have to increase the subscriptions of their research database. EBSCO, Science Direct, Scopus, Telos and Francis, even SSRN, some of them are already free. You know, and, and they are usually uh, open to negotiating their prices. You know, I know personally because when I worked as part of the uh, research committee in my faculty, sometimes they will approach us wanting to see what they can install. And we ask them, we want three months free. And they are ready to give the three months free subscription just for the community. Three months is enough for somebody to be able to have access to the database and finish their research. And some of this research is not calling for something from scratch. So some researchers that are smart, when the universities announced these calls, a lot of the professors I'm seeing their work are saying that these are things they have been thinking about, issues that they have been thinking about, but they have not been able to align it to the COVID circumstance and come out with an idea that they're working on, that they're looking into. So, for example, I find uh, for universities that really want to uh, boost the ability of their staff or their uh, uh, researchers to be able to connect internationally with research opportunities, there is this almost, um, when I say, uh, a research that a funding database that I think every university should look into is called the Research Professional. Okay, is a UK-based organization. For the past 20 years, they have been collaborating and collecting research opportunities, both in the private and public, and bringing it together. The good thing now is that they have made the COVID-related research free. When the University of Malaya brought it in, I, I was thinking they were, you know, the university subscribed to it for, for, for good. But actually, the university subscribed for it, I think, for about a year. And then they came and actually gave us demonstrations how to use it, how to utilize it. And it was very rich. So research professional, now all their COVID-related funding um, opportunities are free. You can set those ones free from any part of the world. But maybe for the other non-COVID-related research, is you, you have to have a subscription, but yet yeah, still they give you a seven day free trial and they, um, they are quite uh, happy to discuss terms. There are, uh, I found also um, other funding websites and other funding opportunities that are calling researchers from all over the world. They are open for you to put in your research proposal, collaborate with people from anywhere in the world you know, together. It may be that you may not be able to do the physical uh, interview or whatever, but maybe they can provide you with the literature that will enable you to contribute 
for the doctrinal side or the literature review side where while they do the other side you know whatever the situation is it's always good to get on board and don't think i cannot do anything from my home you know so you you have the frontiers you know you have innoget i will put this uh, in the uh, chat uh, for people who are interested innoget is actually very good it has been quickly put together by a private organization and they are uh, you know it includes like uh, when the uh, commissioner said that uh, uh, somebody in the state has been uh, able to create something innovative you know this um, this um, platform will allow you to connect with those who actually need what you have produced and they will be uh, able to assist and then collaborate and maybe uh, engage you can you know take the supply from you or something like that now almost every or mm, a lot of these countries nigeria also has the research council right the national research council there is hardly any national research council that is not doing something related to covid Okay, international, for example, the IGRC in Canada and the, um, the Australian Research Council, the UK ESRI, in ESRC, the Economic Social Research Council. If you have access to the internet, search these organizations and then you can see that they are asking for researchers. Try your best to get your name on there and see what they're working on that you can assist. You know, and um, I have the mindset that COVID-19, especially now, after three months, we have, it's possible for us to physically go into the offices. Well, I'm in contact with the universities here. You can go into the office. You only have to uh, comply with the uh, uh, protocols that have been given, you know, uh, wash your hands, do whatever you have to do. But until we see the end of it, you know, people have to continue the activity. Uh, the um, the Scandinavian countries, you know, I have seen quite a lot of calls from there, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Germany, uh, Japan, South Korea, and they are looking to work not just for people within their country because they're interested in what other people think. They want to get other uh, perspectives from other parts of the world. So I think it is a great opportunity, you know, and the the, the Nigerian government also you know i'm sure has a lot of um at least uh, some um maybe grant or um workshops or something that they can do but i, I really don't know you know but i what i really don't um subscribe to is the idea that my i my um research uh, has no um has only the um local significance you know, whatever idea that I come up with, as far as this COVID situation is concerned, is is pos is possible for it to impact somebody? Is possible for it to um, be recognized elsewhere? So, to that extent, a lot of uh, transnational, interdisciplinary research is is being called for, and people should think uh, along those lines.